Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name is Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. We're going to continue reading discussion of the book, Code Word Barbalon, Antichrist is a Woman Again. Uh, Antichrist is a Woman Alive and Well Again by P.D. Stewart. And uh, we'll be getting right in the middle of the page 137. We'll be beginning right in the middle of the page 137. I'm going to back up a, con uh, a, con a paragraph of continuity. It says, All historians acknowledge that the ascendancy of the popes began in 508 A.D. when King Clovis of the Salian or Merovingian Franks later to become France, won the decisive battle in the Catholic and Arian religious war, thereby settling the dispute in favor of the Catholics, but that their temporal reign officially began in the year 538 A.D. when Roman Emperor Justinian subdued the last of the three kings. Remember the three horns that would be uprooted the three horns that opposed the rise of the papacy. So 538 A.D. marks the beginning of the reign of Antichrist on the earth. Now the author continues, It was at that time that Roman Catholicism was made the state religion, and all other forms of worship were forbidden in Christendom. Dr. Somerville, uh, Somerville writes, quote, Justinian enriched himself with the property of all the heretics, that is, non-Catholics, and published edicts in 538 A.D. compelling all to join the Catholic Church in 90 days or leave the empire and confiscated all their goods, unquote. Now, I said at the end of the broadcast, that's essentially what's going to happen in this country. We're either going to go along with this Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order, or we'll be rendered non-citizens, have no rights, and uh, exterminations, inquisitions, tortures, all kinds of war, acts of war against God's people, and wholesale confiscation of their property. I see this as, as uh, uh, a reenactment of history. Rome never changes. Her tactics are always the same. She confiscated all the goods of the uh, Jews she exterminated during the Second World War. This is a mark of Antichrist, theft. You know, our God says, thou shalt not steal. Well, Rome's got her own laws, and they run diametrically counter to God's law. So, they confiscated all the property of the heretics. And this began the reign of the popes in 538 A.D. This is the beginning of the rise of Antichrist. The spiritual and temporal power all vested into the breast of the pope. And the author continues, he says, The great Gibbon states the same in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire. This is from chapter 47, paragraph 24. And it says, A Catholic writer proudly confirms, quote, When Rome, that is, pagan or imperial Rome, before the rise of the popes, through the neglect of the Western emperors, was left to the mercy of the barbarous hordes, the Romans turned to one figure for aid and protection, and asked him to rule them, and thus commenced the temporal sovereignty of the popes. And meekly stepping to the throne of Caesar, the vicar of Christ took up the scepter to which the emperors and kings of Europe were to bow in reverence through so many ages. So here came the rise of the, uh, the, the uh, Holy Roman Empire and the popes, and all the kings of Europe and the known world would bow to him for centuries. Now, this is going to become very apparent as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy as we continue. 
It says, from that time, the papacy reigned with absolute power from her official installation in 538 A.D. for a period of 1260 years, known in history as the Dark Ages, which period was brought to an end by Napoleon in 1798. So we have a 1260-year period, exactly 1260 years, a time, times, and a dividing of time, three and a half years, or 1260 days, and we ascribe a year for a day in prophetic reckoning from 538 A.D. to 1798, exactly 1260 years, the reign of the popes, the Dark Ages. And the papacy received its mortal wound by Napoleon. We, the, the current pope was taken off the throne, taken into exile, and he died in exile a year later. Now the author continues, he says, But how do we know for sure that the little horn mentioned in Daniel chapter 7, verse 8, 21, and 25 is a hieroglyph for Roman Catholicism? We need only look at the description of that little horn power in Daniel 7 and compare it to that given of the woman in Revelation chapter 17. The beast of Revelation chapter 17, verse 3 and 7, upon which the quote-unquote mystery woman sits, is clearly the same beast of Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, 20, and 24, and of Revelation 13, 1, for all three beasts have ten horns. However, Revelation chapters 13 and 17 give us additional details about this ten-horned beast, or power. It tells us that the beast not only had ten horns, but it also had seven heads. We shall come back to the seven heads later. As already mentioned, it was from 538 A.D. to 1798 A.D., a period of exactly 1260 years, that the popes ruled with untrammeled, untrammeled power until their long and unforgettable reign was brought to an end when Napoleon in 1798 had his army under General Berthier enter the imperial city of Rome and proclaim it a republic. In other words, he liberated it from the papacy. And he carried away the equally imperial pontiff, Pope Pius VI, as a prisoner to France, where he died a less than imperial death the following year on the volcanic island of St. Helena. Now, we're told that on the day of his captivity, Pope Pius VI was sitting on his throne in the Sistine Chapel, receiving the congratulations of his cardinals on the anniversary of his election, when this short reign came to an abrupt end. Arthur R. Pennington of the Historical Society says of this event, quote, All of a sudden, the shouts of an angry multitude penetrated to the conclave, intermingled with the strokes of axes and hammers on the doors. Very soon, a band of soldiers burst into the hall who tore away from his finger his pontifical ring and hurried him off, a prisoner. Through a, hall, through a hall, the walls of which were adorned with a fresco representing the armed satellites of the papacy on St. Bartholomew's Day. In other words, vivid on the walls were frescoes depicting the slaughter of 70,000 French Protestants during this, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. And so the papacy ended after 1260 years of darkness and murder and slaughter and inquisitions and crusades and holy wars and spilling the blood of the innocents, spilling the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. Now, in case you ask, how prove we that the time period mentioned in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, three and a half times, is the same as 1260 years, we will now attempt to answer. 
Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, tells us that the reign of this dreadful power would be, quote, until a time, times, and a dividing of time, unquote. What is a time in Bible prophecy? Revelation 12, verse 14, decodes this prophetic hieroglyph. Speaking of the other woman of Revelation, the pure church, it says, quote, And to the woman were given two wings that she might fly into the wilderness, for instance, a place of safety or hiding, for a time, times, and a half a time, unquote. This is the exact time period given in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, using identical language. And I suggest, says the author, that they must refer to the same events. A time is one, while times is two. Half a time is self-explanatory. But we still don't know what unit of time is being measured in the words, quote, until a time, times, and the dividing of time. Again, Revelation chapter 12 in the earlier verse 6 provides the definitive answer. Speaking of the pure church, it says, quote, And the woman fled into the wilderness for a thousand two hundred and three score, that is, sixty days. One thousand... Uh, 1,260 days. There's your 1,260 days. That's literal years. Now, this is the same woman of Revelation 12:14, for we are told that she flees to the wilderness in both verses 6 and verse 14. And both verses describe the wilderness as her place of safety, where she is fed or nourished by God. Now, since the period mentioned in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, a time and times and half a time, is identical with the time period given in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, then the two must be one in the same period of time. And further, since Revelation chapter 12, 6 makes it clear that the time period in verse 14 is the same as 1,203 score, that is 60 days, then the prophetic time, or times, must be rendered as days. That is, the three and a half times of Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, is equivalent to the 1260 days of Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. But since prophecies are rarely given for short periods of time, we must ask, are these synonymous time periods? Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, and Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 12, just 1,260 literal days, or some longer period of time. We find the assistance to the unlocking of this, difficult, this difficulty concerning the use of small units of prophetic Bible time to represent much longer periods in the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 14, verse 34, which reads, quote, After the number of the days in which ye searched the land, even forty days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. Unquote. Again, in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6, quote, I have appointed, or given, I have appointed thee each day for or equal to a year. Unquote. Here we see that in the Hebrew prophetic time, a day is used to represent a year. So that when in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, we read of a tyrannical power that was to do this thing for a time, times, and a dividing of time, we must translate a day into a year. Now, the Hebrew, or the, Jew, the Jewish year, was 360 days. Since a time equals 360 days in a Jewish year, times would be two years, or 720 days. And the dividing of time would be equal to half a year, or half of 360 days, 
which would be 180 days. Here's how it works out if we were to put this into an equation. A time, one year, equals 360 days of the Jewish year. And times, or two times, would be 720 days. And the dividing of, t of time, or half a year, would be 180 days. Now add them all together. A time, 360, plus times, 720, plus a half a time, 180, which gives us a total of three and a half Hebrew years, or 1,260 days, which in prophetic time is 1,260 literal years. Remember, a day equals a year. See Numbers, chapter 14, verse 34, and Ezekiel, chapter 4, verse 6. It is not only biblical, but also logical to convert the 1,260 days of time prophecy into years. Because in the Bible, prophecies uh, are almost always given for many years ahead and not for the next few days or months. Or so the day in prophetic time always represents a prophetic year and not a literal day. And it gives a graphic showing the decree of Justinian in 538 A.D., which, which marks the rise of the biblical Antichrist to power, and the overarching 1260-day period we've referred to as the time, times, and the dividing of time, 1260 days, or years, of papal supremacy, which ends at the wounding of the papacy in 1798 by General Berthier of Napoleon's army, Pope Pius VI is dethroned, imprisoned, and finally dies. Now the fourth power, remember we were speaking of Daniel, the four beasts or the four kingdoms that would rise upon the earth from the time of the Babylonian captivity until the return of Christ those powers, uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then finally Rome, it says the fourth power, the Roman power, that would arise, says Daniel in chapter 11, would have a ruler who shall be a raiser of taxes. Very interesting, right? Here's a quote. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within few days he, the raiser of taxes, shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up, and shall become strong, and with a small people. And he shall do that which his fathers, that is, his predecessors in the Roman Empire, have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey, and spoil, and riches. Yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. And the king... The one who obtains the kingdom by flatteries, adds the author, the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. See Daniel chapter 11, verse 20, 21, 23, 24, and 36. John Coldhart offers this interpretation in his book, What I Saw in Rome, which view may or may not be correct and stands or falls on its own merits, says the author. I merely draw it here for your attention. Under Imperial Rome, Coldhart says, Remarkably enough, the prophet, that is, Daniel, also described Julius Caesar's successor, that is, Caesar Augustus Octavius, and foretold that he would reign in the days of Rome's glory 
and be remembered in history as a raiser of taxes, unquote. Quoting further, it says, Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, unquote. Daniel chapter 11, verse 20. The beginning of Emperor Augustus saw the beginning of the imperial Rome, which lasted from B.C. 28 until 476 A.D. Augustus's reign has been justly styled the Golden Age, and arts and the learning reached their highest peak. The emperor himself declared that he, quote, found Rome a city of brick and left it a city of marble, unquote. True to Daniel's prediction, Augustus reigned in the glory of the kingdom. The Bible, uh, the Bible chapter that describes the birth of Christ also tells of Augustus' uh, tax-raising propensities. Quote, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And all went to be taxed every one into his own city. And Joseph, the husband of Mary, also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, to be taxed with Mary. And so it was that while they were there, she brought forth her firstborn son and laid him in a manger. Unquote. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. Daniel predicted that after Julius Caesar a raiser of taxes, would stand up in the glory of the kingdom. And here in these verses we find Luke verifying all of it. Augustus's tax plan were the most ambitious that the world had ever seen up to that time. Perhaps our minister of finance got his ideas from Augustus Caesar. At any rate, ambitious tax plans apparently did not die with Caesar and it would also seem that others are apprising to be known in history as the raiser of taxes. Quoting further, it says, The prophet then went on to foretell the character of Augustus's successor. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Unquote. Daniel chapter 11, verse 21. History attests the utter truthfulness of this prophecy concerning Tiberius. It is recorded that as Augustus was about to nominate his successor, his wife Livia besought him to name Tiberius, her son by a former husband. But the emperor replied, quote, Your son is too vile to wear the purple of Rome. Unquote. And the nomination went to Agrippa. Agrippa soon died, and Augustus was again under the necessity of choosing his successor. Now weakened by age and sickness, he succumbed to Livia's flatteries, and the, and the 99th vile one, quote, became emperor. One writer of history says, Tyranny, hypocrisy, debauchery, and uninterrupted intoxication... If these traits and practices show a man to be vile, Tiberius exhi exhibited that character in disgusting perfection. Unquote. It says, Tyranny, hypocrisy, debauchery, and uninterrupted intoxication. If these traits and practices show a man to be vile, Tiberius Caesar exhibited that character in, in disgusting perfection. Unquote. Prophecies fulfilled. And it continues now. Not long ago, my attention was drawn to a Digest article on Tiberius. And after referring to his infamous and dissolute retirement in A.D. 26 to the Isle of Capri, it drew to, to a close with these words, quote, And what was the end of this vile old man? And so there we have popular writer, historian, and Augustus himself all unconsciously verifying the prophet Daniel's prophecy who 600 years before 
had said that a vile person would obtain the kingdom by flatteries. In the next verse, Daniel chapter 11, verse 22, told how the prince of the covenant identified in Daniel, listen to this, the prince of the covenant identified in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27. You've heard me speak of them repeatedly on this program as being the Messiah. That's right. Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27, do not speak of Antichrist as is taught in most of the futurist or rather all of the futurist churches in this country. Those verses speak of none other than our Christ, Jesus. And we simply must correct our understanding of Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27. Again, he says, the next verse, Daniel chapter 11, verse 22, told how the prince of the covenant, identified in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 as being the Messiah, would die during the emperor's reign, and the book of Luke chapter 3 and history make it plain that that was the time of Christ's death, unquote. It was during the reign of these last emperors that the bishop of Rome succeeded in asserting his authority over the four bishops of the Christian church, the bishops of Jerusalem, Antioch, Constantinople, and Alexandria. This primacy was strengthened by the sack of Rome in 410 A.D. by the Goths under Alaric, the first capture of Rome by a foreign foe in more than eight centuries. Then came the raids of Genseric and his Vandals in 455 A.D., and finally in 476 A.D., the deposition of the Western Emperor by the Teuton Odoacer. As each barbarian incursion took place, the position of the emperor declined, while the power of the bishop of Rome, the pope, who became later known as the pope, was enhanced. And so now we see the restrainer receding in power and authority, and the little horn standing up. That which now restrains will restrain until he's taken out of the way, and then that man of sin will be revealed. The son of perdition, the papacy. Now, under the title, A Little Horn with a Very Big Mouth, the, uh, the author writes, Let us look at this aspect of the prophecy more closely. The fourth beast of Daniel 7 had ten horns. Said the prophet, quote, I considered the ten horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Daniel chapter 7, verse 8. Daniel is later given the explanation of what he had just seen. Quote, And the ten horns are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be, di he shall be diverse from the first, and shall speak great words against the Most High. Daniel chapter 7, verse 24 and 25. If the prophecy in Daniel chapter 7, verses 8 and 24 is correct, we should expect that after the Roman Empire collapses in 476 A.D., it was to split into ten nations or powers or horns, followed by the destruction of the three of these powers and the rise of one power in their place. Thus we must not only show that Rome was divided into ten kingdoms on its demise, but also identify the three kingdoms that would be destroyed from the Roman Empire. History accurately records that after the demise of the ancient Rome, there followed ten divisions. Here they are. The Franks, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, 
the Heruli, the Burgundians, the Suevi, the Anglo-Saxons, the Lombards, the Alemanni, and the Vandals. Three of these ten kingdoms opposed the rise of the papacy to power, and they were plucked up or destroyed, just as the prophecy said. These three nations were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. The last of these subdued by Justinian in 538 A.D., the very year in which began the reign of the popes over all of Christendom. Seven of these horns, these powers or divisions, exist down to our time. Here they are. The Anglo-Saxons, now known as modern England. The Franks, now known as France. The Lombards, now known as Italy. Alemanni, which is now modern Germany. The Burgundians, which is modern Switzerland. The Suevi, modern Portugal. The Visigoths, modern Spain. The Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths have no modern counterparts as they were completely uprooted to make way for the rise of the little horn power or papal Rome, the papacy. Now mark well the prophecy said, quote, He shall be diverse from the first. In other words, different, much different. Daniel chapter 7, verse 24 the papal kingdom would therefore be a radical different kind of kingdom. While all the others before her were civil empires, she would adorn her power, her political power, with religious attire. Why all of this history? Because as Isaac J. Lankins, uh, Langson said, quote, we cannot really perceive or understand the menace of Romanism unless we review the history of the past as well as attentively survey the present, unquote. And so, reader, brace yourself, and I beg that you have the patience to examine this matter thoroughly and attentively, for we shall now probe the mystery to the very bottom wherever that leads. Now to begin chapter 22, if you're following along, page 144 in the book. It's entitled, Seven Kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is yet to come, and the beast is the eighth. Begins with a scripture, Revelation chapter 17, verses 10 and 11. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Sound confusing? The author's going to attempt to unravel the mystery of Revelation chapter 17, verse 10. And before we even start, I'll inform my listeners that this is the first time that I've ever heard this interpretation of Revelation chapter 17, verse 10, and it differs from mine. So I will read the author's interpretation of this as he verifies it through other authorities, and you can be the judge. He continues, he says, Concerning the history of Antichrist, the angel of Revelation informed the Apostle John that in this system there would be eight kings five of whom were already fallen, in other words, in the past, one of whom existed at the time, and another that was yet to come, and that the beast power, that is the one yet to come, who would be the eighth, and yet would be one of the seven. This last or eighth king, it is said, would go into perdition. It would go into perdition. In other words, Final destruction. Who are these eight kings, and how could the eighth, called a beast, also be one of the seven kings before it? At first, this seems to make no sense whatsoever, not the least because a beast is said to be a king. 
this is a great riddle, a Holy Ghost riddle, and we must solve it. Let us turn to history and see whether there is anything anything there in history which corresponds with this angelic prediction. We shall solve this riddle using the words of Revelation itself. Quote, And the angel said unto me, wherefore, did, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and the ten horns. Revelation 17.7 the angel says to John in the verses preceding the one under our contemplation, quote, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Revelation 17, verse 1, 3, and 9. A woman is, as we've already seen, the symbol of a church. This woman is called Mother of Harlots. Therefore, she must be an impure or corrupt church. See again, Hosea chapter 4, verse 15 Isaiah chapter 1, verse 21, and Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 1. We've already arrived at the conclusion that the corrupt church, that is, the woman who rides the beast, is none other than the church of Rome, a conclusion which will be even more abundantly clear here and, here and after. But what are the seven mountains upon which the woman sits? William J. Reed explains in his lectures on the Revelation, quote, This part of the angel's explanation concerning the seven mountains is of great clearness and importance. It describes and fixes the locality, in other words, the geography, of the civil power symbolized by the beast in such a way as to pre that it precludes the possibility of mistake. There is a city builded upon seven hills, which has long been known as the Seven-Hilled City, which we proved in an earlier chapter to be none other than Rome. This name is well known to every student of history, unquote. The Seven-Hilled City, Rome. Everyone knows it. Now, and to confirm this interpretation, the angel tells us that, quote, the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Revelation chapter 17, verse 18. And so what first seemed to be a great mystery and a riddle is by this explanation from the angel plainly made to appear. Quote, that that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth is the city of Rome situated on the river Tiber, 410 miles south-southeast of Vienna, 600 miles southeast of Paris, 730 miles east by north of Madrid, 760 miles west of Constantinople, and 780 miles southeast of London, longitude 12 degrees 55 minutes east, latitude 41 degrees 54 minutes north longitude. For what city but Rome reigneth over the kings of the earth at the time of John, when he had this vision and these other things? In this language of Scripture, as given by the angel of Revelation, the church of Rome is presented to us no longer under the cryptic symbolism of a harlot, but in plain language, as a wealthy city that would have power over the kings and the rulers of the earth. Yes, reader... What a horror! The city is the seat of the blood-stained persecutor of the saints, Papal Rome. The angel tells us further, quote, And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. 
And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Revelation 17, 10, and 11. There are many fanciful interpretations of this passage. One I've read says that these are seven literal popes, and that Pope Benedict the Sixteenth is the seventh, and after him the eighth, the final one, will come. In this notion, excuse me, is this notion correct or founded on speculation? And what does the prophecy mean by the seemingly nonsensical phrase, quote, the eighth is a, is of the seven, unquote. Lo, reader, on this very point, a discovery has been made by the Holy Spirit. The seven kings represent not seven individuals or seven popes, as some have speculated, but rather seven different phases of Roman government or seven forms of the Roman government that ruled from the seven-hilled city at different periods during the same empire. That this is no mere fanciful assertion on my part, made up to give credibility to my own theory, I here quote the well-known historian of Rome, Tacitus, quote, In the beginning, Rome was governed by kings. Then, L. Brutus gave to her liberty and the consulship. A temporary power was conferred on the dictators. The authority of the Decembers did not continue beyond the space of two years, neither was the power of the military tribunes of long duration. The arms of Lepidus and Antony were surrendered to Augustus, who united all things under the name of prince in the imperial government. So here we have from Tacitus a list of six forms of government. Now Tacitus here expressly mentions six forms of Roman government that leave just two more forms to be identified as having existed under the Roman Empire. William Reed confirms, quote, The seven heads of the beast symbolized not only the seven-hilled city, which was the capital of the Roman Empire, but also the sevenfold government of that empire, unquote. This is a well-known historical fact that, quote, There were seven modes of administering the civil power of Rome. First the kings, then the consuls, then the dictators, then the Decembers, then the Tribunes, then the Emperors, that's six, and the Dukes had one after another held the scepter. But the prophecy says five are fallen. In other words, the Kings, the Consuls, the Dictators, the Decembers, and the Military Tribunes had fallen. And the one is, meaning the sixth form of Roman government, that of the emperors, which was the sixth form in historical order and was the one, that subsist, uh, the one then subsisting when the Apostle John wrote, unquote. The prophecy continues, quote, And the other, that is the seventh, is not yet come, unquote. That is to say, a dukedom, which form of government, as the prophecy said, must continue but a short space, unquote, or a short period of time. This was the seventh form, which lasted about 160 years, some say 200 years, each of which is a short time compared to the duration of the other forms of the Roman government that preceded it, or in fact, of the papal power, which is the eighth, form which followed the dukedom. Now, which form does the papal power emulate? I have a note to myself here that it, it duplicates the power of the emperors. But the author continues, he says, was the dukedom of Rome of short duration? According to the renowned historian Edward Gibbon, it continued for a period of 200 years. 
when Italy was divided unequally between the kingdom of the Lombards and the exarchate of Ravenna, unquote. If there was ever a man to whom we can go to for the history of ancient Rome, Gibbons is one of them. I accept his word, says the author. The prophecy then adds, quote, And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. Revelation 17.11 This eighth form of Roman government, being after the dukedom, could only be that of the popes, which is the eighth. For although seemingly different from all the forms of Roman government that came before it, yet it is of the seven. Quote, unquote. It is of the seven. What proof have we to back this interpretation? Read Dan Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 and 8 in the Old Testament, where it tells us that the fourth kingdom, the papal horn or power, would uproot three of the ten horns of the seven-headed beast, leaving seven horns with the little horn becoming the eighth, but yet belonging to the seven, because it came out of the nations that make up the final kingdoms left after the demise of the Roman Empire. The beast of Revelation chapter 17, verse 3 and 7, upon which the quote-unquote mystery woman sits, is clearly the same beast of Revelation 13, for both beasts have seven heads and ten horns. Quote, and I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. Revelation 13.1 And the beast of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, is also the same beast of Revelation, for it too has ten horns but being depicted in its final state when the previous seven heads or forms of government had already passed away, it is seen by Daniel as having seven horns, but just one head, the final form, which is papal. Papal Rome, the Pope's kingdom of blasphemies, is a prolongation or a continuation of the same pagan dominion of the ancient Roman Empire under the guise of a Christian church. For the angel told Daniel that the eighth horn, although, quote, shall be diverse or different in form or presentation from the other seven horns, would also be one of them. Said the illustrious Bishop Newton, quote, it is the same old, idolatrous, persecuting domination in its last form of being, the very form in which it is destined to go into everlasting perdition. It shall not, it is as it did, it shall not, as it did before, cease for a time and revive again, but shall be destroyed forever. Unquote. Yes, the eighth was to go into perdition. That only means, folks, that it is the papacy, that eighth and final form of government to rule over the Roman Empire, the eighth and final form, the papacy, will go into perdition. Quote, And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and goeth into perdition. When was it, and when was it not? It rained. For 1,260 years, it was, and then it was not, when Napoleon destroyed it in 1798. It won't die and come back. It's just going to die. Praise the name of Jesus. We'll see you tomorrow on Inquisition Update.